Hi folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for listening to the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food and real results. Today's guest of the show is Dr. Alan Christensen. You may know him from seeing him on CNN, The Today Show, The Doctors, and many other places. He's a specialist in the thyroid and mountain unicycling, as it turns out. So it's a really fun show. Stay tuned for that. In other news, it's been a crazy exciting week. As you may know, George and I just released a new app called Caveman Feast uh, for the iPhone and iPad in the Apple Store. And we've already beaten out on the first day uh, Food Network and everyone else to reach number one in the food and drink category. And we're even in the top 10 overall, which means that we beat Angry Birds, and we're up there with Minecraft, and all of a sudden we're competing with Disney and all these other places, which is just absolutely shocking and humbling. So uh, thank you so much for believing in real food. If you already have the app, uh, I hope you're enjoying it. Please let us know what you think and take a moment to leave a review in the Apple Store. And if you haven't already gotten it, then what you can do is basically just type in Caveman Feast in the App Store on your iPhone, iPod Touch, or iPad, it'll come right up, or you can go to fatburningman.com to check it out. And for uh, the next few days, depending on when you're listening to this for launch, uh, we're offering it at just 99 cents, and the price is gonna be going up soon, but we wanted to make sure that you could get it for as close to free as we could get it to you for. So um, make sure to grab that before the price goes up. So thanks once again for all of your support. Hopefully we can crack and hit number one overall in the App Store. That would be absolutely amazing, and this is the week to do it. So uh, don't forget to leave a review. That always helps. And just take a moment to tell your friends if you believe in what we do. Um, that would be awesome if you could tell them about Caveman Feast and how much they would like it. All right, so in the show with Dr. Allen, we talk about what you need to know about your thyroid, why you might consider eating protein in the morning, a healthy dollop of it, and what it's like to be a semi-pro off-road unicyclist. All right, let's go hang out with the doc. All right, folks, we're here with Dr. Alan Christensen, who's a Phoenix-based naturopathic doc who specializes in natural endocrinology with a focus on thyroid disorders. His numerous media appearances, appearances include CNN, The Today Show, The Doctors, Insider, and Shape Magazine. Aside from being a fellow health crusader with a passion for knowledge, one of Dr. Christensen's ridiculously cool hobbies is mountain unicycling. <laughs> How's it going, Doc? It's going great. How are you doing today? Awesome. So why don't we just start right there? I think that's really the most important thing we can talk about today. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about mountain unicycling. <laughs> so about 86 or so, I started mountain biking. And that's been a passion forever. Uh, that, rock climbing, been the biggest ones. Probably about 2009, I was in a large road bike race. And I saw a couple guys on these 36-inch road unicycles. Yeah. And they weren't competitive with the cyclists, but they were moving pretty fast. And it blew me away to see these guys doing that. Next thing you know, I found myself on YouTube looking at unicycle clips. <laughs> and here were some guys doing crazy stuff off-road on technical terrain. And I thought, how cool would that be? You yeah. know, and it was a steep learning curve, but <laughs> actually, no pun intended. I was just riding around the block the other day, and I realized that the time I've committed to working out, to, to being able to ride off-road at a high level on unicycle, I think I could have learned two foreign languages. <laughs> <laughs> so what is that like? The, the physics hope. always just blow my mind of how that's possible, especially when you go off-roading. Can you give us a quick, a quick tip for getting started on a unicycle off-road? Well, the first step is on-road. <laughs> okay. That's, that's and, a good tip. You know, the cool thing, your, your listeners, a lot of folks are fit. They do pretty intense activities. Anybody who's reasonably athletic, you can ride and learn, learn to ride a unicycle. Yeah. It's about 10 to 15 hours of mostly falling. And <laughs> falling sounds a little dramatic because after a little while, you get really good at landing on your feet coming off a unicycle. Yeah. So most of the falls are really just what we call unplanned dismounts. So uh -huh. <laughs> they're not too dramatic, but there's probably 10 to 15,000 falls. And then you wow. can turn the pedal a dozen times. And then you got to learn to to corner, to to cover some more distance, and it's a whole different set of muscles and core work. It's crazy. Yeah. You're never coasting. You know, you're always working. And you're always really engaging your core for it. Right. So that's probably about you know three three months or maybe three four or five months to get the hang of that on the road. Then you go on the tiniest bit of uneven terrain. <laughs> <laughs> that is so crazy. So how fast can you go on one of those things? 
I ride a 24 inch unicycle primarily off road. You know, there's no gearing. So our yeah. wheel yeah. diameter and our crank arm length are the main factors that control your speed mm -hmm. because your cadence, you've got kind of a range of speed at which you can pedal. On the 24 inch one, which I use for the hardest terrain, I can cruise long between seven to nine miles per hour. Wow. Do a 26 or a 29 inch unicycle for less extreme terrain, and then I can come to maybe 12 miles per hour. And then I've got a 36, 36 inch for on road. That thing's huge. Yeah. <laughs> and that I can cruise long. If I really work, I can hit 14 miles an hour for some stretches. Wow. That's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad at all. <laughs> all right. Well, so let's shift gears a little bit, if you will, and, and go and start talking a bit about um, one of your main areas of expertise, which is the thyroid. And I know, I know a lot of people who listen to the show, um, myself included in my family, the thyroid is a big issue. So can you talk a little bit about uh, what the thyroid is and why uh, people who might not even think that they have a disorder now might need to pay attention to it? You know, it's such a big deal. It, it blew me away as far as the magnitude of its power in my medical training. We've got this thing. Imagine a bow tie in terms of where it sits in your body, in terms of its size, and roughly in terms of its shape. So you've got this thing kind of like a bow tie below your skin. When it's healthy, you can't feel it. It produces hormones that if you could put them all by themselves in your hand, you couldn't see them. Their physical quantity is so small, about a tenth of a grain of salt. Wow. If that stuff was gone, your whole process of converting fuel into energy in your cells is shut off and you're heading into a coma. you got a couple weeks to live. Uh, if that little tenth of a grain of salt was maybe a full grain of salt, your heart's going to give out in maybe a matter of days. So the level of control on that is huge. You know, I think about it like a switchyard, like a switchyard in a train station. You've got this car of coal and you want to get it to go to the furnace but if the tracks are set wrong, it can go in this random pile, just make a mess. Mm -hmm. That's your fuel in your body and your cells, and you're going to generate energy out of that, or you're going to store it somewhere. And the thyroid hormones are the biggest factor that flips that switch. Now, there's a lot of chemistry in those hormones coming out right, and it's pretty delicate. And a whole lot of stuff that we're exposed to every day tends to bioaccumulate more so in the thyroid than even your liver or your kidneys. Mm -hmm. A lot of factors can start an autoimmune response. Some families are more susceptible than others, but once that gets going, that exacting level of control over that critical element, it's not, not working right. So how do you know if it's broken or not uh, working correctly anyway? If it's horribly broken, you can, you can notice it across the road. You mm -hmm. can spot someone and identify it obviously. Yeah. When it's subtly broken or at early stages, that's, that's the million dollar question. There are pretty objective signs that show up at the earlier stages of autoimmune disease. And those are signs that reflect changes in the structure of the thyroid. Hmm. So examination, ultrasound, that's the most sensitive early way. There's blood markers that can show it at early stages, thyroid antibody tests or whatnot. They can miss it quite a bit when it's there. You know, upwards of 40% of the time, they may suggest there's not a problem when there wow. really is a problem. Wow. Then we've got blood markers of thyroid function. And they're very accurate, but the ranges with them really suck. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to figure out how tall an average male was, and I went to an NBA locker room with a tape measure, <laughs> <laughs> what kind of number am I going to get? Yeah. <laughs> so thyroid blood tests, we make these averages based upon the people who get thyroid blood tests. Mm -hmm. you know, how often do your healthiest, most fit followers run in the lab to get their thyroids tested? Right. You know, not every day. But those that have thyroid problems and those that have the most unstable thyroid problems, they get the most tests done. So this normal range gets so spread out and so unreflective of the healthy populations. We've got good data about healthy populations, but that's not factored in enough to medical practice. Hmm. Interesting. So what is the delta then? What if, if the range is wrong, what are you looking at and how do you interpret those numbers? Say if you do go and get a test. For sure. Biggest single marker we look at is the TSH, and that's the thyroid stimulating hormone. So I'll step back just a second. Your whole endocrine system is a corporation. Now you've got a CEO, you've got a manager, and you've got workers. <laughs> so the CEO would be the hypothalamus, you know, that kind of runs the show, gives the overall direction. The main manager would be the pituitary. That's under control of the hypothalamus, but it's really giving day-to-day -day interaction with the workers. So the pituitary tells the thyroid to work. So in this little scenario, we have to imagine that the workers are lazy. If they're not being able to work, they're probably on Facebook or you know who knows what else. Or... Sure. <laughs> so 
they only work when they're stimulated. So thyroid stimulating hormone is backwards related to how much the gland is doing. If the gland is on Facebook, the TSH gets higher, you know, it <laughs> makes it work harder. If the gland is like overdoing and burning itself out, the TSH shuts off. So it's backwards marker. Most laboratories using the range of average scores of the population they test say that 0.4 to four and a half would be normal. Mm -hmm. And statistically it is for those that have thyroid disease, you know, uh, the largest study to date was done in 2004. They started with about 10,000 people and they whittled out everyone that had known thyroid disease, thyroid suspicious symptoms, strong family history, medications that could skew thyroid function, a few other factors, anything that can make the thyroid not perfect. They got the boot. Everyone who was left had their thyroid tested many times over six months. Mm -hmm. so we got to learn from that what the scores ranged from one person to another, but also how the scores ranged from one person to themselves over time. And the funny thing is both of those ranges were almost identical. Hmm. So healthy people display very minimal variance in thyroid function. So that 0 0.4 to four and a half in this healthy population, there was never one single score above 1.9. So that high end of that range, that 1.9 to four and a half, mm -hmm completely normal by all laboratory guidelines, but it doesn't show up in healthy populations. Interesting. So the most common, easiest screening test, the TSH, if that's two or greater, that's a red flag. That's mm -hmm. pretty suspicious. And what do you do after that? After that, we confirm and see if there are signs of autoimmune disease, you know, via antibodies, via exam, via structure. And we really also just tease apart all the factors that give rise to it. You know, it's an interplay between genetics, inflammation, environmental toxins, nutrients, other hormones in the body, mm -hmm. the response, uh, chronic infections, allergies. So we really tease apart for an individual which of these things may not be ideal. And the cool thing is that the more leverageable identified culprits that are found, the more points for correction that exist in the earliest stages. There's an early continuum at which helping the causes can often arrest the process. Mm -hmm. There's stages to where it's still good to help the causes, but the horse is kind of out of the barn for the gland and it needs some help for longer term too. Mm -hmm. So once that happens, it's basically like there's this, there's this threshold where you can reverse it for a period of time. And then after that, you kind of need to coax it along is it forever or is there reversing it and healing it then too? Well, there, there is, and there's, there's a couple thresholds and I kind of see this by what someone's dosing requirements are. There are those to where they really do need at least initially replacement, but if that's done right, that doesn't take away from what they're producing. Mm -hmm. All the other steps are done well still, then they still have a chance to raise their own output. And there's others to where, you know, we know how much hormone the gland makes, and if they're not even close to stable until their dose is about that full amount, we know that their contribution is not a heck of a lot. Yeah. And cases, there's just less optimism for them to put out quite a bit. And, you know, that, it's fine. As long as we do things very well, they're just as function, just as healthy as everybody else to where that happens internally. Yeah. So in the uh, paleo community, and there are a lot of folks listening who are paleo, uh, Hashimoto's is, is fairly common, especially compared to the traditional, uh, or, or at least the average person on the street. I think paleo attracts a lot of those folks. So I, I think a lot of people have confusion about what exactly that is, what it means, how you get it, how you get rid of it, that whole thing. So can you give us a, a basic primer? Love to. So Hashimoto sounds pretty exotic, right? Uh, Hiroko Hashimoto was a Japanese physician. Thyroid disease is most common in populations that have the greatest iodine takes. So Japan, quite a bit of seafood, quite a bit of cultural use of seaweed in the diet and highest rates of autoimmune thyroid disease, thyroid cancers, nodules, goiters, all of that. So it happened to be found out to be what the cause was at that area in the earliest point of history. And Hashimoto's is just an autoimmune attack that breaks down the thyroid. People often make a big distinction between hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's. Mm -hmm. The reality is in the modern world, there's very little difference. You know, if someone has hypothyroidism, they probably have Hashimoto's mm -hmm. and the vast majority of people were never told that, but there's not a lot of other common causes for that in the modern world. Now, globally, it's a different story. You know, right now on planet earth, we probably have about a billion and a quarter people who didn't get full cognitive development because they didn't have even adequate amounts of iodine as they developed. 
so they can have goiter or non-autoimmune hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. In the modern world, it's pretty much autoimmune, and that's most commonly Hashimoto's disease. The relevance of it on top of hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism being just the lack of hormone, Hashimoto's is an immune attack producing a lack of hormone. Mm -hmm. Got the lack of hormone to, to, comp to compensate for and think about, but there's also this immune element. And that's important all by itself. You know, not only does it destroy the gland, but it hurts the body from using the hormones, and also it can elicit into other autoimmune states too. So what is the uh, intervention and what happens after that if, if you are diagnosed? If someone is diagnosed, ideally, it would be understood what are the triggers to the immune system. And that can be a lot of factors. You know, funny thing is that iodine too much or too little, the amounts we need are exacting and they're very narrow in range. Mm -hmm. Someone does have an autoimmune response, the levels shift and they're even lower. So getting that dialed in really well. There's an interplay between environmental toxins. So I talked a bit about iodine. Your gland is so hungry for it that there's a pretty unique relationship with it and that mineral. You know, if you were to talk about calcium, magnesium, potassium, zinc, they've got hundreds of jobs in most all parts of your bodies. Iodine has one critical job in one area, and the amount that you need for the thyroid is way above what you ever get in your circulation. Mm -hmm. So this concentrator, and that's cool, it's helpful, but the problem is that there's a lot of stuff we're exposed to, a lot of chemicals that have enough similarity to iodine that they get sucked up by that same concentrator. So that's part of the triggering process. Mm -hmm. There are factors that alter our immune system that make us more apt to go after that once the wastes are present. One of the simplest ones is just not being optimal in vitamin D. So when someone has the disease, it's a matter of really pulling apart all these kinds of factors. And it can be different factors more relevant for some than others. And compensating for what the gland is not doing and helping all the partner glands, you know, yeah. the adrenals, the ovaries, the testicles. They're all part of this big chessboard, you know, and a move here affects what can be moved there too. And <laughs> yeah. And so when it comes to iodine specifically, a lot of people who start eating in a natural way, they, they toss the traditional table salt, uh, which is often a source of iodine. So how do you know that you're dialing that in correctly? Should you be taking a, a kelp supplement or eating seaweed? Uh... Such, a, such an important question. Paleo communities are in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. You know, you get a decent amount of iodine from animal foods. Uh, most types of animal protein, especially seafood, egg yolks are pretty rich in that. So paleo folks rarely have a problem. Vegans can run into troubles. You know, I'll see people who are vegan, they're not getting egg yolks, dairy, they're not getting any seafood. Mm -hmm. They may not get sea vegetables. They're often using non-iodized sea salt. And they may have a high amount of foods that slow iodine absorption, you know, a lot of goitrogenic foods. So I've seen a few populations, uh, a very notable young man who is consuming many pounds of raw vegetables, mostly broccoli per day, and zero other food, mm -hmm. <laughs> manifested iodine deficient goiter and a lot of other symptoms. Wow. So to stop that, and he got healthy again. And <laughs> right. So I, I think a lot of people do that. They're just like, well, if some green veggies are good, then I'm just going to eat, you know, 15 pounds of them every day. <laughs> so it's not, they're not the problem. In the context yeah. of adequate iodine, that, that's great. You know, have your green veggies, but, but yeah, have, have enough variety, have some quality proteins in your diet, and you'll do fine. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as supplementing it, kelp specifically, it runs people out of that narrow, low range of the lowest rate of thyroid disease. You know, iodine is the most studied mineral on the planet, and there's over 10,000 human studies, which wow. I've seen distilled into a single graph of here's your iodine intake, here's your risk of thyroid disease. And there's, there's a very, very tight curve with a low bottom. Mm -hmm. That low bottom represents about 100 to 300 micrograms per day. You know, once you're below that, once you're above that, all kinds of thyroid disease increase, which wow. is fun. The reason why too much is a problem is that pump is so powerful that if you ever get a lot, you blow the fuse. You know, it's coming in so fast, the gland has to protect itself, so it shuts down the machinery. Mm -hmm. Relevant to kelp, that does get to be a bit much. That's not true for other types of seaweed. You know, have a sheet of nori a couple times a week, mm -hmm. that's awesome. Throw some kombu in your dishes or your soup that you make. Have some soup with wakame. Uh, snack on duels here and there. You know, those are awesome foods. Lots of good minerals. Mm -hmm. Appropriate amounts of iodine. 
Most of those will give you about 70 to 100 MCGs per serving. And in the context of a week, several times, that's a good thing. Kelp, you can get up in the thousands of MCGs per serving, in supplemental form especially. So you actually tell people to stay away from kelp, generally speaking, as a supplement? Yeah. Very interesting. There's, there's this idea that comes up so much to where we think of functions in the body as stimulants, not as catalysts. Mm. And it's very rarely the case that it's true. So there's a perception that if your weight's not right and thyroid, low thyroid can make you gain weight, any way you could goose the thyroid would help. Yeah. The other part of that perception is if the thyroid needs iodine, you know, why not just load your body with iodine? That would, that would goose your thyroid. That would make you lose weight. Mm -hmm. and I call this the spark plug analogy. You know, catalysts are like spark plugs. Mm -hmm. you know, a V8 car, half your spark plugs are shot. That car's pretty sluggish, and it's going to be a dog going up the hill. Yeah. Put the spark plugs back in, it's a whole new experience again. But if you were to dump a bucket full of spark plugs under your engine, under your hood, mm -hmm. you're going to go 10 times as fast. Yeah. <laughs> become formula one because of that <laughs> that's how nutrients work and that's how hormones work i love that analogy things are terrible and they come back it's awesome but if you go way above what the capacity is catalysts don't make things occur better or stronger or faster <laughs> right so where does it, a lot of other people who are listening to this are kind of in like the bodybuilding circles or, or fitness modeling and they want to optimize and obviously getting your thyroid in optimal condition is, uh, is really important to that process uh, because it has a lot of consequences on metabolism and that sort of thing. So what do you recommend to those folks who might not have a recognized disorder or problem, but they want to get optimal use and function out of their thyroid? You know, for me, I, I don't really have a distinction between an overt disease and suboptimal function. I think about like a continuum for sure, and there's those to where they have uh, major structural problems, they may have cancer started, they'll need long-term therapy, and those to where it's not quite ideal. And in any case, it's, it's worth doing the steps to make it work perfectly. Once, once you're above, this is so crazy, but once you get above what your body's ideal needs are for thyroid, what happens is you engage your body's ways to block thyroid. Hmm. This is so crazy powerful that there's just all these levels of steps and control above the gland, literally in terms of making it produce more or less, but also below the gland in how we convert the hormone, how we activate it, how we eliminate it, how our cells absorb it. So if you just pour a lot in the system, in a very short period of time, all these downstream pathways, they just amp up the elimination and the blockage of it. You know, that just makes your body numb to it. Yeah, that is so interesting. <laughs> and then when you when you mentioned, uh, you know, taking a big spike of kelp, that's no good. Um, but eating certain other things, it's not like you need to be eating them every single day, but a few times a week if you have a bit of nori or something else that's, that's high in iodine, that's great. You know, one of the funniest things, RDA, the reflex answer, what that stands for is recommended daily allowance. Mm -hmm. Someone looks close, it's recommended dietary allowance. It's actually not daily. Mm -hmm. It's so true that our needs for certain things, especially those that are not water soluble, we think about the needs in a bigger in a bigger period of time. You know, it doesn't have to be exact right amounts of stuff all the time. But if mm -hmm. you're getting over the course of several days or over a week, which is where even like RDAs come from, you can stay pretty steady on that. Yeah. Yeah. Some things that are water soluble need more quickly. They're different, but minerals are pretty stable. Mm -hmm. So. I'd like to um, talk about something a bit different and just ask you kind of a, an, uh, a different kind of question, I guess. Knowing everything that you know, you've been doing this for a long time, um, how do you live your own life? What do you eat? What sort of habits do you employ? Because I think there's, it's always so interesting to hear the, uh, the advice that someone might give to the general public compared to what they actually do themselves. So can you just walk us through a, a day in life? I think it's, it shows a huge amount of, of perspective on your part to think to ask that. That's what <laughs> the people too, like, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> it comes down to. And then the other question is, are you actually doing it? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> you know, in terms of food, I'm pretty close to paleo. I manage endocrine disease, and a lot of that's diabetes too. I've tracked scores and scores of people for lots of time with continuous glucose monitoring. Mm -hmm. And I've done a lot of that myself too. And some... Listeners might know about that, some might not. It's a way we can check someone's blood sugar 24-7 for about a week. We can get scores every minute of the day. And then we'll timestamp physical activity, 
dietary food intake and correlate that with blood sugar changes. And there's so much data that apart from getting hit by a truck or getting shot or having to plague, you know, like trauma or infections, most everything else that goes wrong to us, there's some element of blood sugar control, Mm -hmm. you know, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, stroke, dementia, all that. There's some element of poor glucose control. So it's such an important thing to dial that in. I've seen a lot of data from tracking people that if your starch intake is too low, your body will overcompensate. You'll actually make a little more starch than if you had eaten a small amount of healthier starches. Mm -hmm. I do deviate in that sense that I'll do quinoa, steel cut oats, brown rice, some legumes. I've done a fair amount of food intolerance testing on myself and others and there's ways in which we can identify which things are immunologic triggers for individuals more than others. So I look at things that are not antigenic, not problematic, and I'll be pretty targeted as far as the amounts relative to my training. Uh, but really, my diet is primarily good quality proteins. I personally do also, for purposes of variety, do a fair amount of eggs, egg whites, some of the new high quality um, alkaline, well combined vegetable protein powders. I'll throw those in. I'll also do some egg protein powders and some non fat and sweetened Greek yogurt, some quality seafood. We've got nature's fed beef. They come out to our house and load up our freezer in the garage every so often. <laughs> grass fed organic stuff. That's wonderful. Uh, we get boxed greens deliveries. You know, they get big boxes of organic produce. We never know what. And mm-hmm. that's real fun. That's a fun part, yeah. For activities, I've gone through a lot of stages where I've been like super OCD on, on a sport mm-hmm. and just done the nth degree I could do with my my particular physical makeup. And that's been, you know, road biking, mountain biking, rock climbing, some of the biggest ones. These days, I'm doing all those things kind of recreationally. Mm-hmm. You know, I, this morning I went for a fun ride on the road bike. Tomorrow I'll take my son out on the mountain bike trails. We'll probably do some climbing on Sunday morning, you know. So I'm not at the top of my game on any of those things, but I'm having fun with all those. And twice a week I'll uh, goof around in the gym. You know, there's a workout I do a lot you would have so much fun with. Uh, We're out in the desert, and there's washes, and there's open desert all around. So one of my favorite strength training workouts, I go and I rearrange rocks. (laughs) (laughs) That is so cool. I've got this huge wall that I've been building over the last couple of years, and I just pick up rocks and I carry them. You know, it's the most primitive thing. Yeah, it is. Activities where I'll, I'll get smaller ones, and I'll balance the biggest one I could overhead, and then I'm walking on uneven trails, and I'll cover 100 steps, you know, and then I'll do 100 steps with my other hand. Yeah. And then I'll do 50 steps doing a tricep thing. Mm-hmm. I'll do chest passes with big rocks. But the more warmed up I get, the bigger rocks I work with. And I'll spend a lot of time just farmers carrying the biggest rocks I can. And then kind of the pinnacle of that is there's ones that I couldn't carry, but maybe I could just slide or maybe roll over. And I'll just, you know, work my butt to the ground and move those as far as I can. And <laughs> That's awesome. That's one of the best workouts I've ever heard on this show. I'm going to say. <laughs> Think about making a video out of it, but I you, you guys would probably love it. <laughs> totally. Yeah, especially if you somehow combine off-road unicycling with carrying huge stones. Right, the unicycle, get back in the wash and then start. <laughs> I love that. That. That hits me close to home, too, because my first uh, job that I had was actually with my dad, who's a stonemason. And so it was this super primal work of just carrying rocks and stones and cement and that sort of thing up and down ladders the whole time. So I I can't remember having a better workout than something like that. Angel human workout, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's intense. All right, so we're, we're coming up on time, but we have time for a few more questions. Uh, topics. One that I'd love to cover with you is cortisol. Where does that enter into this whole process? It's something that no one wants to think about. Everyone assumes that it's okay, but usually it's not. You know, awesome question. I'm I'm so jazzed about my third book. I just got the contract in place about a couple of weeks ago and I couldn't ask for a better team, but it's going to be all about the cortisol weight loss connection. I've not really seen it done well enough on a big scale. So that's a big, yeah. big mind these days. Yeah. And Cortisol, adrenals, and thyroid, I, I told my editor that if you're a nerdy endocrinologist, TNA means thyroid and adrenals. <laughs> 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 they're, they're that inseparable. You know, they yeah. tie so much. So funny thing about cortisol is that we think about classic stressors. Most people get the idea about fight or flight and <clears throat> the tiger, the nasty boss, whatever else, you know, setting it off. But 
what if you spell stressed backwards? You know, you get desserts. Yeah. <laughs> so a big part of trauma and stress to the adrenals is blood sugar regulation. You know, the more work they've got to do to back up the pancreas, to back up the stomach emptying rate, the more strain they're going to overcome. And it's no different at all from the tiger or the nasty boss. Mm -hmm. And the crazy thing, too, we're learning is that there's a lot of enzymes that act with your fat tissue. You know, fat is not just the storage, it's super active stuff, but your fat tissue makes a lot of cortisol by itself. So you can be in different chemical states in which your fat makes you stressed, which makes you more insulin resistant and strains the adrenals harder and you get more stressed. And it's yeah. this vicious cycle. <laughs> it's crazy. So huge. And the timing of it's a big deal too. You know, the medical world has really seen that the timing of cortisol, that morning spike and that nighttime shutoff, it's huge for your mortality. You know, you need to have that. You've got to jumpstart your day, your internal coffee machine, I call it. And you've got to, to go to sleep. And if those things don't happen well, you're screwed. You know, you're not really going to do well. So, so much data on that. And one of the biggest single, single things you can do is have a high protein breakfast. Hmm. Magic number is about 30, 35 grams, high quality protein, about an hour after you get up. <clears throat> it's so powerful for really stabilizing and dialing the cortisol as the day goes on. Very interesting. Sure. So what about, you've probably heard a lot about um, bulletproof coffee and uh, eating, uh, a, a, doing a ketogenic fast in the first half of the day instead of doing something like a high protein breakfast. So what are the effects on, on cortisol if you do do something like that? Well, they're detrimental. You know, the, your, your cortisol and your blood sugar sit on a seesaw. So when your blood sugar drops, your cortisol elevates. You know, that's, that's, what, that's what cortisol does. It, it creates more of a breakdown of glucose from your stores and pulls that in your bloodstream. So under extreme stress, that's what gets you out of harm's way when you're hungry or tired and there's not really much resource there. Your body draws it out, and that's how cortisol works. Mm -hmm. So I think there's probably certainly some value in not having the same stuff all the time and perhaps occasional fasting like we probably had a lot of. But the more the more regular that is, the more we're going to have chronic cortisol elevations. Mm -hmm. Some cases, it's actually useful in the short term. You can actually help to reset a morning level that's off. But the tough part is you may disrupt the afternoon slowdown. Mm -hmm. What you do in the moment is having some effects immediately upon your cortisol, but the biggest effects play out like six to ten hours later. Okay. So you might not even realize what you're doing at the time. It's, it's when you're restless, you know, 10 hours later when you're really feeling it. The thing about so much continuous glucose monitoring is you can look at the big picture of how things play out in that moment, but over the course of the full day and the following days too. Mm -hmm. So what is the best way to control your, your blood sugar um, through, uh, I guess, your own dietary intervention? Uh, good, good amounts of protein, good amounts of fiber, appropriate amounts of starch, and not a lot. You know, most don't need tons. If you're doing huge amounts of endurance activities, it's a little bit different. But most people do well with even what I call a, a condiment type quantities of carbohydrate, <laughs> like quarter cup, a few tablespoons, and yeah, the healthiest, lowest glycemic ones. For sure, the biggest thing to minimize is fructose and all of its guises. You know, that's, that's the most traumatic. So the lower you can go on that to a point, the better, really minimizing it. Mm -hmm. And so you're talking about fruits as well? Fruits as well, for sure. Yeah, I'm glad, glad you clarified that. Uh, fruit juices, large amounts of dried fruit. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I first started going very strict paleo for a period of time, kind of experimenting myself, I was doing more training and I was racing more. Mm -hmm. And I found that to maintain any kind of semblance of ratio of macronutrients, it was a lot of yams and raisins. Yeah. <laughs> the math of my sugar intake and my fructose grams intake and like whoa this is not the intent <laughs> yeah yeah and i think that's right that's one of the biggest errors that i see in uh in paleo specifically because basically what paleo does is it allows you this framework of, of almost like all you can eat as long as it's paleo right so if something's paleo everyone says that it's that it's 100 good so that leads people to eating handfuls of raisins or 10 pounds of bacon or something like that, which clearly, you know, it's, it's good to have a solid dietary framework, which you combine with a bit of common sense. Yeah. Well, right? Now, what about non-dried fruits? Is there a, there a limit that you recommend for most people to maintain health? You know, for most people, if they're decent body weight, decent health, I wouldn't encourage them to stress too much about that. The, the bias that I have that I always try to bear in mind is that most people that I work with 
are on the spectrum of metabolic disease. Mm. That spectrum is a lot bigger than you might think. You know, many have this idea that if you're morbidly obese, if you're living on sugar, you might develop type 2 diabetes. The crazy thing is that the most recent numbers, I just read this a few days ago, uh, of those who are obese, not overweight, but, but uh, obese, BMI of over 30, their risk of some level of insulin resistance is about 80%. Wow. So, so the flip side is 20% of people that are really big are healthy, mm-hmm. you know, no issues at all. Now, if you're not obese, the absence of some metabolic issue is probably about 60%. Mm -hmm. That means 40% of people that look perfect can have the same stuff going on internally. Wow. um, Fatty liver, that's a huge topic, perhaps sometime we could go into, but such a big coming epidemic, you know, fatty liver, insulin resistance, prediabetes, and that stuff about normal and optimal on thyroid, the same data exists about blood sugar. Mm -hmm really with it optimal, we'd see a lot of people that would seem to be healthy that are really on the continuum towards diabetes. Wow. So it's, it's an important thing to bear in mind for anyone. Well, we've got a couple minutes left. Why don't we talk about, um, I, I don't think we covered this before, fatty liver. Uh, just, just for a couple minutes, uh, what is it and why, why is it important? Boy, it's the biggest thing that no one hears about. Yeah. Uh, term medically, there's NAFL, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And there's NASH, which is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. hepatitis. That's the more severe form. Mm-hmm. We always tag in non-alcoholic because we're talking about this condition in someone that doesn't have an excessive alcohol intake, you know, more than two to three servings per day. Alcohol is so much like fructose in terms of what it does to the liver. Uh, so what happens is that, remember the, back when we got the coal car going into the furnace or going into the pile? So one of those big piles is your liver. So if your fuel is not getting burned right, those exact same calories, they just get dumped right there in your liver. And they create structural change that impacts the functional chemistry. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much crap all over the place that the liver cells can't do their job and move bile through and detoxify and conjugate and all that stuff. And it it gets to be a vicious cycle because the liver has many roles in benefiting your blood sugar metabolism. So once it gets goofed up, the whole thing starts to snowball. Mm -hmm. Many have argued that this is probably a quarter of adults, regardless of body size. You know, wow. a normal range, here's something for the listeners. Everyone gets, assuming you get blood tests, there's a thing called a chem panel. One of the markers is ALT, marker of liver function. All the hepatologists agree upon this fact that I'm about to say, the normal range is meaningless. Uh, if you're a woman and your ALT is above 18, which is well within normal, there's probably some condition present, which could be fatty liver or something else. If you're a male, the magic number is 28. So 18, 28, both well within normal. If the number's above that, check check more, check more, out your liver in better detail. Yeah. Wow. Excellent. So um, just, just a minute left. Can you tell folks uh, where to find you and what you're working on next? Yeah, for sure. Uh, integrativehealthcare.com is my clinic website. That's kind of the center, center clearinghouse of all the stuff we put out. We, we do uh, videos a couple times a week. My doctors do a smaller podcast, nowhere near like yours. <laughs> <laughs> we do one every week on various topics. And I've written The Complete Idiot's Guide to Thyroid Disease and now Healing Hashimoto's, which is just coming out uh, actually tomorrow on Amazon. Oh, uh, wow. Print- Terrific. <laughs> and now I'm getting going on a title in works, but really about adrenal function, cortisol, and weight loss. And that'll be about like January of 2015. Busy. So, busy guy. I have a lot of smokes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. C, for coming on. And I encourage all you folks to check out uh, your books as well as your website. You're doing some great work. These topics are super important and not enough people are talking about them. So we're going to uh, give you all the help that we can there. <laughs> yeah, you're doing an awesome job. I followed your stuff for a while and I love all of it. And you got to awesome. do what you're doing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So we'll have to get you on again soon. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about fatty liver or mountain unicycling or something else like that. (laughs) All right. Thanks so much.